going to call this meeting to order. We'll call the meeting, uh, the committee as a whole meeting for human resources and education. I'm calling to order. Uh, roll call, please. Okay. Mr. Hannigan? <laughs> Mrs. Heinz? Here. Mr. Derman? Mr. Lou? Here. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mrs. Tipton? Here. Mr. Jeter? Here. Mrs. Seeley? Mr. Betancourt? Mr. Womack? Here. Mr. Panks? Mr. Lamarck? Mr. Alfred? Here. Mr. Here. Mrs. Belisario? Here. Mrs. Mullet? <coughs> Thank you. Would we all please stand and um, we'll be led at invocation, the Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Alfred. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we would like for you to bless this board tonight while they conduct all the business that comes before us for the students of St. Tammany Parish. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, we're liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We do have um, people that have requested time on the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Mellon. Uh, before we begin the agenda items, I'd just like to recognize that we have uh, Jim Garvey in the audience with us tonight. He's our Bessie representative for District 1, and we very much appreciate you being here, Mr. Garvey. I'm glad to be here. I heard y'all be talking about the Common Core, and I wanted to come uh, see the presentation and answer any questions if there were. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, first we have... Um, Tara Ogeron to speak. Ms. Ogeron, if you would just please step up to the podium and state your name. Hi. Um, I'm Tara Ogeron. Um, I have a child uh, in the fifth grade. Um, and I just wanted to make a statement about um, why I'm against the Common Core. I've been doing a lot of research. And I ask that myself that every time that I hear someone uh, mm -hmm. spout off the usual talking points about it being uh, career and college ready, uh, more rigorous, aligning the states. Um, but the first thing that uh, comes to mind is uh, I don't, the, the way it's been implemented, um, you know, if it's really the right thing uh, for our children, I think that it needed to be implemented at the beginning um, with children coming into the school system not with fourth or fifth graders or anywhere in between um, where there's chances of things getting left out. Um, you know, um, yeah, in my research, I've uh, seen uh, the list of the teams that came up with the Common Core state standards. Uh, they're college professors, educational companies, uh, just a couple of teachers uh, were involved on those teams. And there are also experts coming out that have major concerns about them being developmentally excuse me, inappropriate uh, for younger grades. Um, there are ones coming out about um, that, for example, uh, there's the Joint Statement of Early Childhood Health and Education. Um, there are people that have been on, that were on the Common Core team um, or were asked to be and refused because they did not feel that it was actually going to do what it claimed, um, which was prepare our children for college. Um, some of those people were Sol Gar Garfunkel, Sandra Stotsky, James Milgram. Um, and in, in my research, I find a document on the Louisiana Believes website that's a, a birth to age five standards, which in there they state they're aligned to the Common Core. They're aligning things that don't we don't even know if they work. My child hates school. He feels like he is not um, able to do it. Um, I am, I, I want my child to reach his full potential and I think this is doing harm to him. I think that it is causing him to feel like a failure because maybe he can't think the way that, um, yeah, that, that that college professors and educational companies think he should think. Um, 
and I just ask we we don't we don't know if it works so um, I, I just can't understand why we're condemning children to um, to something like that thank you thank you next we have uh, Sarah Wood hi good evening my name is Sarah Wood and three of my four children I also feel the same thing that her my daughter is experiencing the same thing I have three three of my four children are school age and they attend Mandeville High Mandeville junior and Tefuncta middle I'm here tonight because of concerns my husband and I have regarding the content to which our children are being exposed under the guise of English or language arts I would attempt to address, address math as well, but it seems so complicated that I can only say that homework is unreasonably difficult, using algorithms and lessons foreign to my husband and myself, and they don't seem to have a real learning purpose. Beyond frustrating my children and making them dislike math even more, including my one child who used to be our math whiz, even he is not very excited about math anymore. As to ELA, I will begin with stating that the overall intent appears to be one, and you'd have to be an idiot not to realize this, using material that clearly injects a message of anti-America, anti-family, and anti-Christian notions, and basically anti-traditional anything anything using content that is obviously very negative and inappropriate for young and influential minds. This first started or came to my attention at home, came to my doorstep when my 15 year old came home and told us of new concepts that were replaced before Christ and Anno Domini as a calendar indicator. The teacher informed them that the reference materials for world history, which they would be using, would refer now instead to before common era and common era. I thought this was ridiculous. My 15 year old, his ELA is on anti-family and anti-parenting themes. He was required to read Marriage as a Private Affair about an ignorant father whose Christian beliefs won't let him forgive his son's choice in a wife. It shows Christianity in a very negative and intolerable light, which references to the Bible out of context, quoting St. Paul's letter to Corinthians says that women should keep silence. I thought you weren't supposed to take sides on religion. Then my 12 year old began coming home with stuff entitled Great Depression, but really only having to do with segregation and slavery and how horrible white people were. I felt that she was being provided selective information to point her opinion in one direction. I put my foot down when they were made to read an article by Linda Monk, who amongst many things appears to be an antagonistic writer from the Huffington Post, where she obviously states her dislike, if not downright hate of conservatives and Republicans of the right. The article that my daughter was made to read quoted Justice Thurgood Marshall, who I have every respect for, but who is also on record very biasedly stating that white people have discriminated against black people for so long that it is now black people's turn to discriminate. My 11-year-old also came home concerned with a magazine from which he was required to reference and answer questions for a reading quiz, which included an inappropriate political cartoon, one with a missile replacing Ardinejad's nose, references, and I would like a minute to finish my statement, please. I'm almost done. He had to answer, reference and answer questions for a reading quiz, which included an inappropriate political cartoon, one with a missile, replacing our Dinajad's nose, references and questions for him as to gun ownership in the United States, highest divorce rates, which I questioned as trying to point out to my 11-year-old that maybe marriage, a traditional religious institution, does not work globally. And my favorite, why is the US not listed as a kid-friendly country? There are so many other concerns with content that I do not have time to cover, and I will not have my child read or study from these things. These things are not appropriate, and even if they were, they would be mine and or my husband's job as their parents to discuss them based on our beliefs and our ideas, not the school's job at all, and certainly not outside of my presence. I have several emails, if you'd like me to forward them to you, expressing my grave concerns with more detail. 
but I know I do not have the time. My question is, and I want this answered, who is responsible for this content and why are children being exposed to content obviously meant to guide their developing minds toward left-wing, progressive, or whatever, whatever type of ideology. It shouldn't be pointed in any direction. I do not send my children to school, which my taxes support to have them indoctrinated in any, even the smallest doses. I want the school board to make every effort to stop this now. And by, by that, I mean Common Core. If anybody bothered to consider history very clearly, it is very clearly where such teachings lead, and without a doubt, it has never led to more freedom. You are teaching my children to be shepherds, to be led to the slaughter, not able to defend themselves against what is happening in this country. Shame on anybody doing that. Thank you. Next, we'll have Dominic McGee. All right. Good evening, board members. I want to thank you for taking the time to hear our concerns. My name is Dominic McGee, and I've been a resident of St. Tammany Parish for over 25 years. I grew up here, and I'm a product of the public school education in this parish from second grade all the way through high school. After graduating from LSU, I made a decision to come back to St. Tammany Parish to raise my family. I did this because I believe that they have the best public, public school educational system in the state. We have amazing teachers here who really love their students and really care about education and this was my experience and I want my children to have the same. However, I'm coming because of the uh, the common core issue that we're discussing today. I'm not a stranger to education policy and how it works. In high school, I had issues with outdated textbooks and I participated in the textbook adoption process. In college, I testified before Bessie and the Senate Education Committee and Council regarding the science curriculum. I'm telling you this about myself because I want you to know that as young as I am, I have always been interested in public education as a student, a parent, and a citizen. My concerns with Common Core, which disturbs me the most, is that it's taking away my right to be heard. Gone are the days of voicing my concern about standards to the local level. If I have issues with what my child is being taught or how they are being taught, tied are your hands, mine, my principal, and my teachers. I am not happy about the way this federal program has shut out my voice and now yours too. It's not only unacceptable, it's against the law. The U.S. Constitution leaves educational policy up to the states. Common Core mandates that states must agree to this program without any room for change. This violates three separate statutes that Congress has passed prohibiting the, the Department of Education from supervising, directing, or controlling our curriculum. Common Core has centralized educational control to Washington, D.C. It's unacceptable with the way this process was passed, the lack of transparency, no proof for Common Core's success, the cost of implementation for this program, and many more reasons I don't have time to address tonight. I am asking that the school board please tell Governor Jindal and Bessie that the citizens of St. Tammany are outraged about P Common Core. We do not want the federal government dictating what is taught in our school systems, and it is unfair to the parents, to the teachers, and most importantly, to our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ralph Rashto. Rosh Good afternoon. Good I evening. thank you for allowing me this uh, platform to express my views. The, a lot of people have shown up in regards to Common Core, and I'm one of them. I don't even have any children, and yet I'm here concerned about this Common Core because I do have a country. And if we're going to have this Common Core, we're going to lose that country. Our education system is the basis of this country. We were able to start this meeting with a prayer, yet we cannot do that in a public school now. We have a whole bunch of people here that are government uh, representatives, 
and I can tell you right now, you won't continue in your jobs if Common Core continues. We the people will make sure that if Common Core is not removed, you will be until we get Common Core removed. I don't have a PhD, uh, any kind of letters behind my name, but you don't have to be a chicken to know what an egg is, and this egg is rotten. We, not, we need to get rid of it. We need to get rid of Common Core. Now, I need a little help. I'm trying to create a website, so I'm pleading to the public to help me create a website to get rid of Common Core. If anyone wants to assist me, I have paperwork up here with my name and contact information on it. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. I skipped over. Uh, Debbie Sash? Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to tell you a story about how I found out about the Common Core. Six years ago, my daughter was attending a small private school in Mandeville. During that time, the school took a grant from the government to teach a math program called Everyday Mathematics. This math came out of the University of Chicago, where Arne Duncan was head of the most failing schools in the country at that time. And of course, he is head of the United States Department of Education right now. At the end of the fifth grade, many children tested into third grade math, and some developed math anxiety as well. Many children were removed from the school. The school discontinued this math program, and currently, on its website now, very plainly states why they are not using the Common Core curriculum. When I saw this same discovery type of math coming to the public schools, it was a red flag for me. I looked into this further and discovered Common Core. The other issue that I would like to discuss in Common Core is the child teacher sharing database. Why was our brand new $4 million database paid for with our tax dollars dismantled at this state? Why was a new one that shared sensitive and personal information on our teachers and students installed without our knowledge? Why did John White, who was appointed by Bobby Jindal, enter our children into a secret agreement with In Bloom without the approval of Bessie, which is illegal? Why would Bobby Jindal keep such a man who is totally irresponsible with respect to our children's safety, their education, and privacy? Why isn't Bobby Jindal pausing Common Core and signing executive orders affirming Louisiana's commitment to local control and student privacy rights as other governors in other states are doing right now? Why does John White, Superintendent of Education, not know that his department is sharing all of our children's sensitive personal information in another secret agreement with the Labor Department through the Workforce Data Quality Initiative grant? This will track our children from cradle to grave. Why is Bobby Jindal's mother the grant contact person and principal player in this scam? We as parents need to know why Bobby Jindal and John White hate our children so much that they would do this to them without our permission or knowledge. Did you ever hear of Common Core before last year? Why didn't our representatives know about Common Core? All of our representatives were circumvented out of this process with the exception of the governor. Please show me all the data with respect to how long and where the Common Core standards were field tested. Why should we subject any child to the Common Core scam that has been concocted by corrupted Democrats, Republicans, and corporate entities? I've only got one minute left. What can we do about this? Please email and phone your reps to take the handcuffs off of our local school boards and teachers by voting to get rid of the high stakes data collecting tests such as PARC. There was also a resolution submitted this last legislative senator, this session by Senator A.J. Crow to get rid of Common Core. I have it here if anybody would like to see who cares about our children and who does not. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Lee Berrios. Sorry. 
Lee Barrios, retired teacher from St. Tammany. I actually wanted to address uh, in this particular three minutes uh, the MFP. Last time I spoke before you, um, I mentioned for the public's benefit, because I, I knew that you knew, uh, the Board of Education developed a ta MFP task force, MFP being the minimum foundation program, the means by which the state funds school districts. Um, that task force met for the first time last Wednesday, or this Wednesday, excuse me, two days ago. Um, on Tuesday, prior to that, um, our District 1, Bessie Representative, Mr. Garvey, who's here tonight, um, requested a meeting with uh, special ed parents uh, to discuss their position, their perspective on the MFP. And I wanted to report back on that. I attended as an observer. Um, families Helping Families put together this meeting for Mr. Garvey, which engaged our District 1 member, Mr. Garvey, in a conversation regarding the development of next year's MFP. It appears that the direction that Bessie is going is to allocate MFP do dollars for special ed, gifted, and talented based on academic performance. Jeannie Bowers, your assistant supervisor of special ed, covered very clearly all the circumstances that make this approach inequitable. Mr. Garvey, who can correct me on anything that I, that I say in error, made it clear that, quote, the momentum of Bessie is towards creating incentives through the MFP to get better results. He said it is believed that it is still possible to, to fund vouchers through the MFP. His reasoning includes the assumption that voucher schools will take more special ed students because they will get more money. Mr. Garvey also said that even with specific allocation of dollars per special ed student, it would still go into a lump sum for the district to allocate as they wish. This contradicts the money follows the child scenario that has been used to justify charters and vouchers. If money is allocated as per law to special ed gifted and talented students based on their individual performance, then it would seem that MFP dollars must be directed towards serving the needs of each of those individual children, not part of a bucket that can be allocated as the districts will. The greatest obstacle in my mind to pay for performance and basing the MFP on incentives is that our state constitution mandates an equitable public education be provided for all children. It does not say it will be provided based on their abilities as determined by an artificial quantified measure created by our state superintendent or state board of education. I wasn't able to attend the first meeting of the MFP task force, but I'll continue to monitor the progress of the task force as I know this board will for the benefit of all our children in St. Tammany. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Barrett. Well, I I, I do have a comment in regards to the, um, everyone who has spoken and as the chairman of this committee, in 2000, January of 2010, this board voted against Race to the Top because, excuse me, because of Common Core, because of the assessments that were going to be put on our students and teachers, and because of the data that was going to be shared. We had local, we were local people making decisions for local, our local school district. Within two months, that local control was taken away by the signature of two people to sign us up for Common Core, our then superintendent and our governor and we have no control. We, have, we cannot do anything other than follow the law. Our local control, let me rephrase that, our local control was taken away with the signature. How can we get it back? <laughs> if someone signed it, I, I'm assuming they'll have to, they would be the ones to unsign. I, I don't, I don't. I don't know that answer other than our governor and our then superintendent were the ones that signed us up and state we are state superintendent excuse me so it is our job to take the school system and make lemonade out of lemons and that is what we're going to do to the best of our ability 
Next, we have approval of the minutes of the committee as a whole on August 1st, Ms. Barlett, if I could, I think it'd be good just for the audience to know that we're going to do a little presentation in a minute on Common Core, so we'd ask you all to stay and then maybe offer some more comments and suggestions as we go forward. So I don't want you to think we've heard you talk and then you were walking away and going to something else. It's on our agenda, two things down, we have a presentation, and then we hope you'll participate with some more discussion with us on that. Yes. Thank you. Second. I have a, I have a, um, a motion and seconded. Do we have any questions from board members? Comments from the public? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? All those abstain? Motion carries. Next on the agenda, we have instruction. Mrs. Araby? You have the floor. The first part of my presentation is on the strategic plan. I promise you it'll only be about five or ten minutes, and then I'll go into my common core. That's just the way the agenda was set up. So just take. Yes, I'm Cheryl Araby. I'm assistant superintendent. I oversee curriculum. I'm also in charge of business affairs, food services, and some other additional assignments. Okay. All right. It is that time of year for our district strategic plan update. It is always at the beginning of the school year. And as you can see um, by this slide, that we have our four task areas. Tonight, our focus is going to be on our core task two, producing experiences and results for our customers, which is our standards three and five. And that is because, as you well know, that we have concluded with our LEAP assessments and how our students have performed. Our capacity standards that we're looking at are standards three as well as standard five, and both of these have to do with the results of our students' performance. Our core task two and our focus activities, it is hard to imagine, but we are in our year five of implementation. So when we revisit our strategic plan in the spring, it will be time for us to begin to look at our updates of our strategic plan as well as our advanced ed recertification. So let's take a look at some of the results that our students had on our LEAP and iLEAP testing. Here you can see our students that met the promotional level. Remember these are our students that are scoring basic and above. And as we look at our fourth grade results, we did take a dip down by 2%, but we're still holding our 90%. And we're real pleased with that. We do know that um, on occasion we do take those small dips but our trend line continues to be certainly since 2006 in an upward motion. We're very pleased, of course, with our eighth grade scores, as you can see these results, that our eighth graders really did take a good trend line in their scores and showing improvement. And this does include all of our first time test takers. Next, as always, we always like to look at our advanced and mastery levels that our students obtained. And these lines in our area of math and ELA in fourth grade continued to grow. That's a great indicator that our students are continuing to make great gains and to meet that higher achievement level. In our eighth grade, we were pleased to see that we did take a big jump in the area of ELA by 40%. And then in our math grade, we at least maintained in our eighth grade math. And we know that this is an area that we'll continue to work on as we look at our curriculum. We also wanted to give you an update on the subgroups. Our special ed, we were very pleased remembering that we do have the highest percentage of special ed students in the state. And we did see the notable gains in the area of our ELA moving to 52%. 
And with that, what we're very proud of is how our special ed department continues to meet the needs of those stu students in providing accommodations and making sure that those students are being very successful. In the area of math, we are seeing a 2% dip, and this will be something that we will continue to look at to see what we need to provide in the way of professional development for our teachers so that they can reach the students. Our next subgroup has to do with our black uh, subgroup, and we're very pleased to show that this particular group moved from 65 to 67 percent gains in the area of ELA, and we're very pleased to note a 3 percent gain in the area of math. This is a subgroup that we continue to work work on and making sure that we're providing the accommodations for those students and we're very pleased with these results. We spoke often about how our free and reduced lunch percentage continues to increase in St. Tammany Parish. We're still looking at last year's at 47 percent. We'll probably see another increase for this year of our students are receiving free or reduced lunches. With that, they're considered the economically disadvantaged subgroup, and we were pleased to see those gains because we know the number of students have also increased in this particular subgroup. I believe that the way we're looking at our results and definitely paying very close attention to our subgroups, that this is just another indicator of how we're meeting the needs of every child every day as we look at these results. And we all know that our theme for this school year has been working together for success, and there's not another way to show that as our, our students continue to show great gains in their achievement, that it is a product of everyone working together, students, parents, businesses, our community, our government, and our employees. And I think even tonight is a great representation of that, of the concerned parents we have and the initiative that they are taking and in being very involved with what is going on in our schoolhouses. And that is why we're so successful here in St. Tammany Parish. And that concludes my presentation on the strategic plan update. Thank you, Mrs. Araby. Do we have any questions from board members? Mr. Alford. Really not a question, it's just a, a statement. Um, we, this board, quite a few years ago, we did our strategic plan. And we always ask for an update every year, and that's what Mrs. Araby is doing for us. And our big thing with the strategic plan was that we wanted to make sure that St. Tammany had high standards. And looking at these, even without the subgroups and, the dis and economically disadvantaged, those gains are, are, are standards that we set were high standards. And I'm so glad that, that we've taken the high road of making sure that we keep an eye exactly what our progress is, is doing in all these groups and that we're doing a good job in doing it. I'd like to kind of thank the administrators and the staff for, for making sure that we keep the high standards here in St. Tammany. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alfred. Mr. Betancourt. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Araby, with all of our scores going up in our different subgroups and what have, is there any explanation you can give or, or some color to like the the leap scores that take a dip down in a particular year is, is there any way to put a finger on that well when we're looking at the data we would look at a particular area so that's what we would look right now you're looking at the overall ELA and you're looking at the overall math, but it is broken down into particular concepts, skills that we know we can look at and to see overall where that um, decline may have been. Typically, you're not going to see it across the board in each and every grade level being the same, but that's the job we do 
From here, we work very closely with Karen Ketty, our test coordinator at, at the district, and then our curriculum specialists get very involved. We kind of sort through it, and then that way we're able to provide additional support to our schools. That seems kind of obvious that y'all do pinpoint a weak area or whatever because, you know, the scores typically shoot right back up. So I was just curious if there's a, you know, any particular reason for a sudden dip enough. Thank you for that okay. answer. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Any questions or comments from the public? Uh, a question. Uh, if you just come up to the podium and state your name. And it is on strategic plan, correct? Yes. Thank you. It's, a, it's on what she just spoke. Yes, sir. My name is Ralph Rostro. Again, uh, you said that you noticed peaks and dips in in these uh, assessments. Uh, can you tell us when the Common Core standards uh, are applied? If you notice any correlation between the peaks and the and the dips in those standards. At this time, that would have not, not had any impact on these assessments because the common cores you'll see in my presentation, it will give you the rollout of when the implementation was. But for these assessments, these were given in the spring and they were given to third grade students and higher. And at that point in time, they would not have been involved with the common core curriculum. Will we be able to track it in that regard? Absolutely, just as we did this evening, as any of the new assessments come out, that will be the job that we will have. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next, Ms. Zerby, your presentation on Common Core updates. Thank you. There it is. And I think, and I didn't have this as a part of my presentation, but I think it may be important to give a little bit background about myself and my involvement before I begin. I am assistant superintendent. I do oversee the curriculum and instruction, but I have great people and supervisors as well as curriculum specialists that we work very closely with. I have 17 years in the classroom, and then I have eight years, four years as assistant principal at Mandeville Middle, and then four years as principal at Lake Harbor, and I'm beginning my eighth year in central office, my seventh year as assistant superintendent. So with that being said, I was given the task to give an update to the Common Core standards. And I will tell you that update is going to have on our curriculum with the implementation of the Common Core standards. With that, I felt like it was important for us to go back and kind of look at the history of implementing standards. It is a law. It, the original law was Act 750, and it was passed in 1979. And with that, it required the Louisiana Department of Education to develop state curriculum guides and core subject areas that listed minimum skills and competencies, instructional activities and materials, and minimum instructional time. It also required assessments to be linked with competencies. The, also, the state law was revised, 17.24, and this instituted the LEAP and required the Louisiana Department of Education to develop and implement curriculum standards. It applies to traditional public schools and charter schools. And this state law came out around the time of 1996 and 97. The Bessie policy, which we all know and we look at often, Bulletin 741, requires each local school district and charter school to adopt and implement curricula aligned with state content standards. Implementing curriculum aligned with state standards is mandatory. It's necessary to ensure that students are being taught in accordance with state content standards, and it allows students the opportunity to do well on state assessments. And as I mentioned with revised law in the 1996-97 timeframe, that was the time when the LEAP 
the in initiation of the LEAP, and that was so that the LEAP was aligned to our grade level expectations and what were being taught in the classroom. So the Louisiana Content Standards Overview, currently the state education policy requires, requires regular review and revision to Louisiana Content Standards to maintain rigor and high expectations for teaching and learning. It must be reviewed at least once every seven years, and this is by the Bessie Bulletin 741. Approved by the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, which is of course what Bessie stands for, and this just kind of again gives that history. 1997 to 98 were the standards and benchmarks. They were renamed around the 2004 time frame to grade level expectations. We as educators consider them to be GLEs. And then just recently, 2010, were the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts and Mathematics. I'd like to mention back in 2004 and 2005 when the grade level expectations were mandated by the state as far as those were the standards that we were to follow, that St. Tammany at that time decided that they were going to write their own curriculum which would be aligned to those grade level expectations. The state at that time did have their comprehensive curriculum, but St. Tammany Parish decided that we wanted to write our own curriculum. And many of you know that that is when the guaranteed curriculum became our St. Tammany curriculum. When we made the decision to write that curriculum, we included our curriculum specialist. It was abs uh, actually my first time coming to central office uh, from my school. And I came and I actually oversaw the writing of the guaranteed curriculum back at that time. We made sure that it was aligned to the GLEs which also meant that our students would perform very well on those LEAP assessments. In 2005, after we wrote this curriculum, I actually went to Baton Rouge and had to present the curriculum to see if our guaranteed curriculum met the standards that were expected from, from us. And once I presented the curriculum and we got approval from the state that it was aligned to the GLEs, then we were able to use the guaranteed curriculum, math in ELA. So the Common Core State Standards. In 2010, Louisiana adopted the Common Core State Standards in English Language Arts and Math. 45 states in the District of Columbia have adopted the Common Core State Standards. The Common Core State Standards defines what students need to learn in reading, writing, and math, and in each grade to stay on track for college and careers. The Common Core standard does, Standards does not mandate a given curriculum to schools. It gives a framework for skills and content students should learn at, at each particular grade level. Now this is given a chart and certainly I heard one of the parents concerns with, with the quickness of the rollout and I want to share with you how some of that came about from the state. When it was decided and the state adopted the Common Core Standards in 2010, that gave us a very short window of opportunity to get our curriculum ready. So in 2011 and 2012, we were to proceed with our current curriculum. In 2012 to 2013, just the last school year, that was going to be for kindergarten and grade one only. With the re additional grades, they were going to, they had a transitional curriculum. What the transitional curriculum meant, they were already pulling some of the GLEs out, the grade level expectations that those students needed to know at the end of the year and some adjustments had begun to be made. It was also during that year that we were going to just transition into second grade for this year with the understanding 
that at the end of the 1415 at the for the 1415 year that would be the year for all grades during the spring just this year in 2013 the state made the decision that we were not going to do the transition for another year that it would be in all grades for ELA and math for the common core standards I will tell you that was a, a very big undertaking we're doing a very good job we have our own teachers that are writing we have our curriculum specialists who are very busy writing and you have many curriculum supervisors who are overseeing that and making sure that it is being done in the manner and the fashion that we would want our curriculum to be completed Our St. Tammany Parish Guaranteed Curriculum, the goal is to provide teachers with resources to support teacher effectiveness and improve student achievement. The changes in the assessments and the deletion of the grade level expectations in English and math are reflected in our guaranteed curriculum. So what does our curriculum, our guaranteed and curriculum include? It certainly, ha at this point in time, needs to support the shifts in our ELA and math. In the ELA, an example of the shift would be in the elementary levels, for the most part, in the past, non, not nonfiction, but fiction was used for the most part. That was the, the text that would be used in the classroom. The shift with the Common Core is to have more of a balance, to have that nonfiction and the informational text a part of that ELA lesson. In our guaranteed curriculum, so that our teachers, it is all online, it gives our teachers an, a great idea of the scope and sequence. Where should you be taking your kids and how long should you be taking your kids and where to get to a particular understanding of a concept. The framework of our guaranteed curriculum has remained the same. We have our enduring understandings and essential questions. This provides the relevance. Why are we, why do we have the <coughs> concepts that we have? The student union pre and post assessments these are provided for our teachers so they can determine where their students are and then they can have their lessons and then did my students get it by the end of that particular unit. All of our units can contain academic vocabulary. We do see a shift in our text-based questions as well as our evidence-based writing because students as they are answering questions it's not just about what they might think or feel. They're going to have to provide supporting evidence. Why is that the case? And so through their reading and through their research, either in inform informational text or in fiction, they're able to support and have the evidence of how they came up with that answer. This is, gives you a snapshot of the scope and sequence that's provided for our teachers. It, it is easy for them to access. It's all in one place in our, on our Blackboard site. And the first thing that the teachers do notice is the scope and sequence. This is great for planning and it's great for them being able to pull their lessons together. We do have a scope and sequence for all subject areas, but with the Common Core being the alignment in ELA and math. This actually gives you a snapshot of what a scope and sequence page looks like. Uh, the teachers are able to see all grade levels and you can see that within the area of fourth grade you have the ELA but that fifth grade teacher they can see the connection of what's going on in fourth grade as well. This is a picture of what is in our ELA curriculum for grade four in our scope and sequence. And at the top, you will see the text 
that um, is our anchor text and by anchor text we mean that that is the book the novel that the teacher is using throughout the unit and getting the students through the concepts and the standards that are required as you see this stone fox is our anchor text for fourth grade that is not a new text I taught stone fox in fourth grade it's a great novel and what we did is we looked at the new standards we actually looked at the text and novels that we have been using from for a long time we knew that those texts fit within our community within our schools our parents and teachers and those were the texts that we went to those are the texts that we continued to use the only time that there may have been a change is when we looked at what the text complexity level is which was a part of the common core standard that we may have had to move a text down a grade and in some instances some of the books we used we needed to move up a grade but that was all done through district through supervisors and through many of our master teachers as well as our curriculum specialist here is a snapshot of our secondary and as you can see with this this is English one and this is more or less how their scope and sequence would look for grades 6 through 12 these particular texts used in English one are the same text that we have used in the past we're going to have maybe a couple of new texts as we continue to develop it but for the most part you see Romeo and Juliet you see the Odyssey Fahrenheit 451 these are texts that our students our teachers our parents and our community are familiar with they have been used in the past it is important and we wanted to share this with you um, tonight because we do know that selection of books has been something that has been brought to our attention it's not anything new anytime there has been a change in curriculum this has always been something that has been brought to our attention so we felt like it was important to share with you that we do have a best practice in place we have shared it with our principals we have uh, ask them to go back to their schools and reshare it with their teachers to make sure that everybody understands that if you want to use a text outside of our curriculum that there is a process to go through and that process looks like this the principal appoints three to five teachers a parent and administrator our designee to the book or novel review committee <coughs> and this would begin if a teacher comes into the principal's office and says I have really found a great book that I think would fit the standard that I need to do for the second grading period and I would like to use it this is the process that would happen at the school the teacher requesting requesting the book or novel must identify the guaranteed curriculum unit and the rationale for the addition of the proposed books or novel a teacher can only rec recommend books or novels that they have personally read and that does not include just the cliff notes we all know you can read a summary but when you read each and every chapter there could be something in there that you would have not have chosen to have as a book read in your classroom the school must provide a copy of the book and novel to each committee member and then it is expected that each of those members would read the book and then come back and making a recommendation to the principal ultimately as the principal should have read the book as well even if they're not directly on the committee because when that comes to her or him as an as a selected book that is presented um, with the committee's feedback they did they then submit the appropriate documentation to their school CNI supervisor next I just wanted to show you just a real quick picture of the math 
This is an example of our third grade. You can see this is our unit one and our unit two. I've even had individuals share their concern that our students aren't going to have to know their multiplication facts or their addition facts. And I wanted just to share this one indication of this description where it clearly says that students will develop fluency of basic facts of multiplication involving factors. And you can see that fluency is where they have to know their multiplication facts. The second unit shares that it goes into place value and problem solving with units of measure. This particular unit, if you notice the place value, would be the second unit in the third grade. This is another huge shift because typically in the fourth grade classroom for the first two or three weeks of school, the fourth grade teacher is spending two to three weeks on place value. Now it will be when that third grade student gets into that fourth grade classroom, they should have that basic understanding of place value as well as units of measure. In closing, working together for success. To ensure that everyone is working together so that our students can reach their potential. Our district is providing monthly professional development to our principals, assistant principals, teacher leaders, and curriculum team mem members. This professional development is ongoing, and it provides that common language, which is a district benefit to our students. This is the framework that our system is built on. That is not a new thing for us. We will provide this presentation and video on our district website, and in the future we will have our unit descriptions up for each grade level posted for our ELA and Math for Easy Access. We're going to continue to work together. St. Tammany Parish is writing their own curriculum to go along with the Common Core Standards to prepare our students for those tests. We are going to be the ones that are going to be sure that the content and the text that is within our curriculum is what we know our community would expect and want. We also know that we need everyone to work together so that we continue to be as successful as we have been. We're a great school system we're a number one school system, and we're going to continue to keep that mark as we work together because we all know what this is about. It's meeting the needs of every child every day. Thank you very much, Mrs. Araby. Do we have any questions or comments by board members? Mr. Derman. Dearman. Thank you, Ms. Mullen. Uh, Ms. Arby, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, as uh, Ms. Mullen had said before, that this changing the uh, to the Common Core Standards was not our decision, but was implemented by Bessie and State Superintendent and sent down to us to do. So we're going to do the best job we can. And if there appears to be something in just like when you're talking about the the teacher adding a book, is there also a process for which the uh, parents, if they have a concern, can also address that with the school? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and actually I meant to include some of that in my presentation. Um, with that, we always encourage our parents to certainly make contact with the school first. You know, make contact with that teacher first, and then if things don't seem to be resolved in the fashion that they believe they should have, then certainly go to that instructional leader, the principal of the school. But as always, if you still continue to have that concern, call our central office. You know, we're in the middle of this with the new standards, and we would more than be happy to review your concerns 
with that a parent may have and to see how we can work through and get a solution. Okay, thank you very much. Mrs. Seeley. Thank you, Ms. Smollett. I would like to add in the fact that I know once a year our central office administration does look at the guaranteed curriculum and once a year after they have met they allow people to come and have public input on that guaranteed <coughs> curriculum. I know myself with the experience of being on that committee um, I've been at the public input meetings and very few parents show up and it is it is announced in the paper and the word does get out but that would be the parents opportunity to give their input of any concerns prior to when it goes out am I not right with that is that, is that so I think it is okay thank you mrs. Heinz Ms. Harabee, I know that when we rolled out the guaranteed curriculum, we knew, and it was said over and over again, that it was a living document and that it would be changed. That's correct. And, um, I, but I, I wanted to know, to meet the new state standards, have we had to change our curriculum to ensure our students' success and to what degree? Absolutely. We have to look what we are seeing with the new curriculum. The biggest focus has to do with the literacy strategies which certainly we had those a major part of our curriculum before. The biggest shift that we're seeing, especially in the ELA, is looking at the text complexity and the writing piece. And that's what we're really having to address. Our writing prompts have had to change. And then the rubrics that our teachers use and the grading of those writing prompts have had to change because of the expectations of where the student should be and how they should have answered those questions specifically because that is going to be a part of the assessment so we have to have our kids ready and that's how we're going about with our curriculum okay. that's, that's all the questions I have for right now okay thank you mr. Alfred thank you Ms. Arby, um year 2014 and 2015 was the year that we're supposed to have it, uh, third through eighth and the high school mm -hmm. implemented. They moved it up a year. In 2012 and 2013, we were in the process of developing our own curriculum, mm -hmm. and then we had to go to the state to make sure that they agreed with our curriculum that we was developing. Do, did you have enough time to get all from the third through the 12th done before before this year started mm -hmm. and how are we are mm -hmm. if you if we haven't completed it all yet mm -hmm. how are you with completing it all mm -hmm. right now we're still writing I'll probably have people writing as we're speaking right now with our curriculum specialists and some of our lead teachers we're, we're ahead of the game right now I would say that with the state making that change at that spring time frame that it really did have a big impact on us writing our own curriculum. Was that Bessie pushing for this to be implemented this soon or was that the governor? I'm, I'm not really sure of where, I just know that I we, we ask Garvey. that, you know, we were told that it would be the full implementation for this school year. But I do know that in St. Tammany, you know how we do business. Right, right. We, we, we got like the news and we had a plan. And, and to be honest with you, we were already planning for that possibility. We're always staying one step ahead. So because of that, I believe we're in very good shape with our curriculum. Okay. I'm not going to tell you it's all written till the end of the school year because it is not. Okay. I will tell you that we have uh, lead teachers who are writing on Saturdays for us. We have curriculum specialists who are writing from the wee hours of the morning till the midnight hour. And then you have your CNI people, supervisors. We're very busy reading it, making suggestions as needed. And then we have another layer, remember, of the pre and post assessments that are also included within our curriculum. So I know that we're in a good place but I also know it, we're, we're moving as fast as we can to make sure that this curriculum is up so our teachers can have an opportunity to, to review it before. 
Our scope and sequences are pretty much up for the year, but the lessons and activities and resources are what we're continuing to work on. Well, I guess uh, one other question for our teachers, for the, career, uh, the development for them going through, through training, what is, your, what is your pace for that? Okay, well remember we had two days of professional development before the school year started mm -hmm. this year. So our principals received toolkits <coughs> at the administrators conference which was very helpful with that. We also had a lot of summertime activities that were presented at, at different schools. And because we were so fortunate to get our literacy grant that we had four days of professional development. Remember that we had more than 400 of our teachers who attended that training as well. So our professional development, as always, we've done a great job with that. Durable and the new teacher induction, our teachers had that three-day training where that Common Core was presented at that time. And remember, we do a very good job with technology. So we have a lot of information through that electronic use that teachers are able to go in and study and learn more. Thank you very much. If I could, I think we, I think we need to be clear that the curriculum that we're writing is being written towards the standards that we're being required to use. That's correct. I mean, it may, you know, it is the standards that we've been given. We have to write the curriculum that goes towards those standards. Certainly if those standards were changed, we would have no problem writing new curriculum that would adjust more properly the other way. So it's important to know that the standards dictate the curriculum. That's correct. We could be above those standards, right? Well, I don't think that above is correct. You know, you, you have to meet the standards that have been given to you. And that's the situation that we're in. What, I, this, what the state gave us are a minimum, right? Or can you be above those standards? I guess is my question. No, the standard is set. What we do and how we get the kids there is what we write in our curriculum. Okay. Correct. Are you finished? That's okay. Nice. Mr. Betancourt. Thank you, Ms. Mother. Ms. Araby. <clears throat> The, the material that I believe it was Ms. Wood referenced that was kind of objectionable, where would that originate? Well, certainly I took quite a few notes and certainly I got the names of the schools. So that is something that I would want to talk with the principal about and to see how that was used and which classroom it was used because I can tell you that I wasn't familiar with that information being in our guaranteed curriculum. Okay, and, the, and what you explained, there's recourse for parents. That's correct. That are interested and to come forward and, you know, address some of these concerns. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have two more board members and I will, um, I will open the floor to anyone in the public after we're finished with the board members if you so just bear with me, please. Mr. Womack. I just want to say how encouraged I am by the parents that showed up tonight and the zeal that you all show. It shows you are interested in your children's education. I'd encourage you to continue to come to board meetings and be a part of the process. Be a part of your PTA. Stay informed with that. Just as you hold us responsible, you elect us to office, and we answer to you. I'd also encourage you to speak to your Bessie members. Well, you have an opportunity and, and to speak to one. If there's one present, certainly speak to them. Address these things that you brought up tonight. What better time than now? But I, I am very impressed with the zeal all of you have shown. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Womack. Mr. Lou. Ms. Harvey, uh, certainly I've been getting emails on this Common Cool back and forth quite a bit there through Mary Kay and I's organization and so on has just been unbelievable. But, so I just was uh, looking at this third grade math frame that we showed and the introduction, multiplication and so on. How might I expect my third grade grandson to look at multiplication tables now as opposed to the way we've been doing them? Certainly you're going to see a few different 
ways that that's being done in the classroom. I still think you're going to see your manipul manipulatives. I think they need to have an understanding of how that two times two is four. And, uh, you know, the resources are there for them. It's all stated in the curriculum. I think the big thing is, is that our students are going to have to be able to know their multiplication facts very fluently. And that is, I believe, some of the misconception with the Common Core standards. How we get the kids there, you're still going to see a lot of similar things that we had going on in the classrooms. Okay, I see no other questions from board members. At this time, if you would just like to um, one by one step up and to the podium, restate your name if you have a question or comment, and make sure you re do realize there is a time limit and we are speaking on Common Core and Common Core only at this time. Thank you. Sarah Wood again. Um, so you all are responsible. You are responsible for the content. And I'll tell you that the stuff that I have has Common Core exemplar on it. Thing I'd like to ask Miss uh, Arby is how far ahead exactly is are the curriculum specialists from the lesson that is actually being covered right now? How far ahead are you in your review? I will tell you that at this point in time, it's different in each of the different grade levels as well as the subject area. I can tell you specifically that in the area of third grade ELE, ELA and third grade math that we're already through till about the middle of October with that writing. But as I said earlier, the scope and sequence with the, with the Common Core standards as well as the concepts has been built for the year where we're writing has to do with the units and giving them the additional resources, giving them websites that, the, that they can go to in order to work on their lesson plans with the students. But insofar as ELA and you're saying we're using a lot of the same text, don't you also have to review those texts to make sure that they align and how quickly, I would imagine the process is actually very stepped up and when you step up processes it doesn't take common sense to know that things can fall in the crack. My other question is, is when you're finding a deviation from what is required with the standards, from where are you receiving any new information? Where are you getting it from? I don't understand your the, question. The ELA, like for example, Linda Monk's, this, it says across the thing, Common Core Exemplar, and I've seen many things like that that say Common Core. Where is that being derived? It's not coming from St. Tammany. No, it isn't. And I'm not even familiar with what you're talking about with the Common Core Exemplar. We do not, in our curriculum, in our guaranteed curriculum, you're not going to see Common Core Exemplar stamped on any of our resources. Here it is right here. Here and it, is. Here it is right here. And it is being taught in every seventh grade class at Mandeville Junior and Fountain Blue Junior. They've looked at this too. Okay, well I'd like to see that. Okay, it says Common Core, Common Core State Standards Exemplar. So my question is, what I want to know is where is any new content from where is it being derived? Any new content in ELA, I'm sp I don't talk to math because that's out of my league. Okay. From where is it being derived? Any new content. Yes. As far as you're talking about the informational text. Essays, the things novels. like that, yes. Informational okay. text that we didn't have hold before, on, a lot on, of the nonfiction stuff I, that we have. Answer your well, I'm just explaining. Okay. Okay. The nonfiction, the informational, the essays, some expert excerpts that were not there before. Those would have been decided by the group of the curriculum writers, which would include your curriculum specialist as well as your master teachers. And then upon their writing of that curriculum and being aligned to the Common Core Standards, then we in the office, we've each been um, given particular grades that we're to read in areas and then reread it before it is linked into our guaranteed curriculum. And I think what Sarah is asking too, where is yeah, from? where is it coming from? And that's, you know, I think you and I emailed last about 6.30 this morning or something like that. And we're going to set up a meeting with you to come in and some of these other people are well. We want to see what you have, I want to see. Uh, that's certainly not something that we put out. 
Um, we need to find out where it came from, and we're certainly going to get to the bottom of that and make sure that you know we put out what we need to do to stop that if indeed it's something that's not something that we would recommend being used. Right, but it's, um, the Linda Monk essay is not an isolated insulin. Yeah. Uh, I have several other things, and they also are linked. The, the What's being used says Common Core. It's coming from actually one of the ones that I found in the FDR inaugural speech comes from, um, I want to say it's Gils, Gilsberg Lerman, or I forget the first guy's name, but it's Lerman, and it's an institute. Um, but I, I don't think, I understand, and I'm going to come meet, yeah. but I want to know, I mean, someone should be able to answer to me from where that information right. is originally derived, because there has to be new stuff. I understand that we're using some old stuff, but the new stuff, I want to know from where it is derived. Well, it sounds like someone is supplementing that from somewhere that we're not aware of, and that's what I'm that's asking you to right. share. With. Right. So there's me, no on, new me, information? Uh, like the instructional stuff, I want an answer as the, to the new stuff. I'm not going to say that there isn't any new informational text that has been put into our curriculum, but I will say, especially in the area of social studies, remember, we haven't gone to the Common Core curriculum. There isn't a Common Core curriculum for social studies. There isn't a Common Core curriculum for science. The Common Core curriculum is with ELA and math. Right, and I'm trying to okay. ask as to so, English. So uh, <laughs> what I'm saying is even if that's marked Common Core and that came from a Common Core website or an index, that does not mean that we have that in our guaranteed curriculum. So that's where my concern is, is in that document, is if someone's saying it was in our curriculum, I'm not familiar with that. Right. Okay, and I'll take you on that. Insofar, could any of the new information, informational text, whatever new material is being injected into the curriculum from the e through ELA, mm -hmm. does any of that come from Smarter Balance Assessment or Park Assessment? Material from that, that sort of would want. Does any? I'm just wondering where the text is coming from, where the content is coming from, and I'm shocked that. You can't tell me. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that's the case. I think what I have said is that in the case of new novels that we have looked at, for instance, if they bring in a new novel that one of our curriculum specialists has read and they believe that it can be used with that Common Core standard, it is something that they would bring to our attention at the district office to see if it matches. And then at that point in time, it would be included in our curriculum. So with these new standards, there is no resource from where your, no centralized resource maybe from where your curriculum specialists are deriving these informational text or any new material in ELA. I will tell you that they have used other um, districts that have been that have written their curriculum for common that's aligned to Common Core. I can tell you one is in Georgia that they have gone to their website to see what informational text they've used and novels they've used. Um, that's where they've gotten some of their information. So there is no from. actual process from where the curriculum specialists seek their re these new resources. There's no guidance as to that. There's no inner protocol as to where your curriculum specialists seek any new information that is required to be or would align with these common core standards. You don't have a protocol for that from where, you know, from where they, they get that information. I wouldn't say it's a protocol. Or a process, whatever. You know. It's a process of where they're writing the curriculum aligned to the standard. They're helping in writing lessons. And then we at the district office review that after they've written it to see if it's aligned. That is the process of the protocol for writing the curriculum. From where does the information come that they do all that to? It's from researching. And it's like I where? said, reading. Where? Just different like, sources, different amazing. available materials. The goal is to make sure that we give the right material to the students so that they can be successful in the standards that are given to us that we must follow. I think we have a responsibility as a school system 
to prepare our students, your child, my child, everyone's child, to be as successful as possible on the things that they will be measured on. That's what we're trying to do. We're doing it faster than we thought we would have to. We're trying to do it right. Have we made a mistake? Evidently so. If we handed out this paper, we want to correct that. We have people that have many years of experience in education that are researching this, looking at the best way, seeing these standards, finding materials to match the standards with our curriculum in the way that we believe is best to do it for the children of St. Townie Parish. Right, and I understand, and I'm not laying blame, no, trust me, I'm I trying mean, to feel my talking, way through I this. And, and what I'm trying to, to, to understand, because I think I have a right to know, Absolutely. is if, okay, say the curriculum specialists are looking at what's coming down the pipeline through the park assessment. Are they using the park assessment to say, well, we're gonna have to focus on this type of content, or I want to know how the content is coming to the curriculum specialist. They're searching. And I understand you looked at Georgia. I got that point. I didn't really get anything more than that. And I'm just wanting to know from where, because I am having a serious issue. Not It's cross, it's cross grades. It, it's not one teacher. It's not one school. Okay, there is a theme here, and, and I can send all of you my emails because I don't want it to, you know, I know I kind of just covered the stuff on the Great Depression and segregation. I think that that is something they need to know. Uh, but I don't like starting with negative without teaching positives of our country first. And that is a shameful side of our country. I thought my daughter should have been taught the positive before. And so I, I could spend a lot of time with all of you talking about the content. I'm still not really getting an answer, and I think that well, it would... It it would be good for you all to just figure that process out in light of the fears, the real fears with Common Core. I mean, that's that's what I'm trying to say. To me, the, it's a question as to content. And I the think we're caught in the catch-22 in a lot of ways that we have these standards that are given to us and we have a responsibility to the students to make sure that they're successful on how they're judged and how they're scored on these different standards and we need to find the happy medium and we can do it the way that meets the needs of our students in St. Tony Parish. And I understand your position. I just think that it does not bode well for confidence when you are pushing down, a, or not you, you are being forced to push down a standard that is not developed. I cannot believe that anybody in education would be shoved. My kids are not guinea pigs. And what if, what if next year she stands here and all the standards are down the toilet, which they they probably will be. This is shameful and it makes you wonder what the real goal is. Yes, it does. Hello everybody, my name is Chris Bright and I live in Slidell and I have, um, my kids went through the system, the school system here and um, now I have three grandchildren that are going to through the public schools. Um, well, one of the things I wanted to mention, um, Ms. Mullet, I believe, mentioned earlier that um, the school board here had initially learned of Common Core back in 2010 through the Race to the Top and voted against Race to the Top. And also, you had mentioned that you were concerned about the database back then also, but. I don't know, but there, there's quite a few of you here that came to our meeting in Slidell, and it wasn't back in 2010, it was just a few months ago, and you all said you had never heard about the database. So you just learned about the database maybe a few months ago. We did not realize that the database that was built for the State Department, for the Department of Education, was dismantled, and that our superintendent, state superintendent now, was looking to take our data and sell it to a, to a company. We, no, we did not realize that. We, okay. we were concerned with Race to the Top in 2010 because we were told that it, our data would have to be connected with other entities. Right. And we well, did not want our students' data Usually when you take money from the government, there's always a string That's somewhere. why we voted so no. I don't know why yes, we keep doing it over and over again. But um, uh, in addition to that, so what I understand is that you, your hands are tied. The school board here can't do anything for us. Is that we, correct? We can do a lot, but we cannot 
we cannot say that we are not following the standards of Common Core. That we but cannot say. But the Bessie Board can do this, correct? I'm, uh, that would be an answer for Mr. Garvey. Mr. Garvey, can the Bessie Board change our sure. standards in our state, whether they're Common Core or whatever? Do they have that ability? Yes, we did change the standards. For example, just recently, we had standards. Mr. Garvey, Mr. Garvey. Mr. Garvey. Mr. Garvey. Mr. Garvey. sir, would you like to go up front, sir? The, the reason I ask this is because our Bessie board members are elected officials and everybody, this is my elected official, Mr. Garvey. And from what I understand, a lot of the Bessie board members campaigns were funded by Mr. Bloomberg up in New York, out of state people funded these Bessie board members and I'm, you're one, I'm sorry. Um, and. It's funny that every person who got these funds was in support of John White as being our superintendent of schools. The one person that did not support it, Ms. Lottie Beebe, and I don't know her, she had like $10,000 in her campaign fund. So what I'm saying is we need new Bessie board members. We don't need outside of our state deciding who's deciding okay. our kids' And education. I appreciate that, but we need to stay. F I understand your comment, but we we do need to stay on Common Core subject. So if you do have a comment or a question well, it does for us, our Common Core because yes, it does. We have I it understand. Now. I understand. If I could respond yes, to sir. correct the information as I know it, only one Bessie member got any money from Mr. Bloomberg, and that was Miss Jones, Kira Orange Jones, and in fact she, I believe, abstained from the vote. Uh, whether to vote for or, or against Superintendent White. And so the, the one person, are incorrect. That, and that's why I said as I understand them, but uh, I believe I understand the facts correctly on that point. So the one person that did receive Bloomberg funds did not vote for John White, as I remember. Okay, thank you. And so if we could just, now the question is answered, so could we well, get it, back it on is, Common Core? Well, it's, the other question yes. was more on the Common Core, Absolutely. and it was can we change standards, and I said yes, we can, and I gave an example that we changed the standards uh, just recently in going to the Common Core. We had, as Ms. Araby pointed out, standards prior to the Common Core. They were called GLE, or referred to as GLE standards, but they were standards very similar to the way the Common Core are standards and they were interpreted and uh, used to design a curriculum by St. Tammany, uh, just as St. Tammany is interpreting and designing a curriculum for the Common Core. But we can change them again, and I asked John White about this and what are the ramifications if we do decide uh, to change them again, because I, as usual, like to keep my options open when I uh, come to forums like this and get feedback and bring it back to Bessie. Uh, I like to know that my options are open and so I asked him directly, can we opt out of the Common Core? And he said yes. And I said, well, what are the ramifications? Uh, are they so huge that in essence our hands are tied? And he said no. He said the, the, the biggest possible ramification would be that we could lose our waiver to the federal No Child Left Behind Act. He said that's not guaranteed because another state has uh, opted out of the Common Core and did not, or actually didn't opt in to the Common Core, and they did not lose their waiver to the No Child Left Behind. But it is uh, a threat, if that, that word's probably not the proper word, uh, but a, a threat or an indication that the feds have passed down that uh, you are at risk of losing your waiver to the No Child Left Behind Act um, if you do not go to the Common Core. Um, and that is, uh, I don't know the full ramifications of uh, losing your waiver to the No Child Left Behind Act, but my impression is that it would be uh, costly, but not prohibitively costly. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Oh, Ms. Le Ms. Beres, you, you could be next. <laughs> Hi, my name is Becky Boudreaux. I have three boys, uh, seven, eight, and ten years old. Uh, 
I have just a couple of little questions, a couple of points. Um, number one, I was told about information about possibly being able to opt out at my school. I found out that um, in opting my children out, it was a piece of paper. It had no standings and no rights behind it because the schools are not equipped with a teacher that can teach anything else but Common Core. The um, issue has been that some of the companies that create the newer information and newer textbooks are all related to Common Core. So it was difficult, is what I was told, in each of my schools. Also, I asked about opting out of testing. Um, the response that I got about opting out of testing, because I was concerned about my children's information, as you were talking about earlier, um, being able to be sold. Um, as a parent, none of you have any right to opt your child out of that testing. That means that it doesn't matter if you don't want their data sold, you don't have a chance in a blue moon to be able to stand up and not have that happen. As a parent, you don't have that option. Yes, ma'am, thank you very much. Um, my other part is that um, my fifth grader is um, at a school, and I won't say the name or nor his nor his teacher's name, for fear that they are that she is actually in fear of losing her job because of the fact that she is trying to fill in the holes, quote unquote, of the sinking ship. Meaning she's trying her best to take what she has been given and fill in the things that she knows because she's been a teacher 20 plus years that her children need to be able to successfully complete the fifth grade and have the knowledge going into the sixth grade. Um, that teacher also is um, trying her best, like I said, to fill in those holes. My son last week learned five different ways in one day how to multiply. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Five different ways because his teacher is a great teacher that does not want to just lay into what this new curriculum and new standards are because not every child will fit into your box. Into, I'm sorry, not your box, common course box. My child is a special needs child and does not always fit into all of that. My child came home just today and sat on the couch, and, and which was very, very upsetting as his mother because one of the things that we tell our, my child, one of the things that we tell that particular child is that one of the ways that God has made him special is because he is a math man. We call him our math man. He came home today, he sat on the couch, and he said, I can't take it anymore. Mama, I hate this. I don't know what else to do, Mama. I can't understand. It's too much. She's trying to give him as much as she can in order to give him the options for the fact that he doesn't fit in the box. But in giving the information, it is overwhelming my child. Um, my last two points are um, very small. My third grader, uh, Mr. Loop is your name? Yes, sir. You were asking about your third grade grandson. I can tell you about your third grade grandson and his math problems. Um, I just have a simple question for you. What is two times five? Okay, it's 10 all day long. And your, your grandson, if he comes in and the question is, Dan has two apples and he has five bins, he will be asked to draw out the bins, five bins, and put two apples in each one, correct? Then what he will be given, because this has actually happened, to my child is a blank. A blank times a blank equals blank. My child put in two apples times five bins equals 10 apples. It was marked incorrect. Because Common Core pushes groups are always before individuals, always meaning that the correct answer that he should have put 
was five bins times two apples equals 10 apples. The teacher could not explain to me why she had to mark that wrong, except for the fact that Common Core Standards tells her she has to always put groups before an individual. My last thing is that I have a very close friend that is a seventh grade teacher. I am in um, studies right now to become a Christian counselor. She calls me last week. She says, I don't know what I'm going to do anymore. She says, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm scared I'm going to lose my job if I don't follow their rubrics that they were told to do. Um, she says, I'm not sure exactly what I'm supposed to do. She's like, I know that this isn't right. I know it's not biblical, but this is where I'm at, and I need my job. So last week, she had to teach her seventh graders at Mandeville Junior High. She was given, there are, they, are, um, doing a nine, they are doing nine weeks on the Great Depression. Yeah. Nine weeks on the Great Depression. Her children last week learned about lynchings. Mm -hmm. They learned about people being dismembered. And they were also given, they were also, she was also given the assignment to play parts of excerpts from a book in which she had to stop, turn it off with tears in her eyes and apologize to her students because three minutes into it, it had already said three times. Now you tell me that I, as a Christian woman at home, is trying to teach my children that God loves everybody. And then they go to school and they hear a word like that. That is deplorable and it's not right. Ms. Barrios, I'm going to, we do have another meeting, just not that I want to not let everyone voice their concerns, but we do have another committee as a whole meeting after this. So I would like, can we do two minutes? Is that a, three? I have okay, down three. to a science now, okay. but I'll try. Okay. <laughs> I first want to just Three comment minutes. on uh, Mr. Alfred's um, question about standards. Standards involve more than just levels of difficulty. Standards also drive the pedagogy, the way that teachers teach, meaning, for instance, the development of critical thinking skills. Common Core claims to move from breadth to depth of curriculum. St. Tammany is, as long as I've been teaching, not focused on either, but required its teachers to achieve both a breadth and a depth. Standards also address the developmental appropriateness, and my analysis of Common Core finds instances that are problematic. I'm confident that our local curriculum, curriculum covers over a multitude of those sins. In the last few days, it was learned that a contract has been awarded to a company called Amplify to create and provide the copyrighted, copyrighted Common Core curricular materials and the rights to create the test for those standards for those states which signed on to the Smarter Balanced Assessments. We also learned that Pearson has been awarded the same opportunity to provide curricular materials and tests for the states, which include ours, who signed on to the park assessments. This creates a whole different ball game. It's become perfectly clear now that there is in fact going to be a national curriculum, and it's not locally controlled as our state superintendent insists won't be. With the curriculum tied to the test, it will be imperative that schools acquire these copyrighted materials in order to have a chance to perform in the high stakes tests. Those tests are designed to be administered on computers. Not only will this represent a huge increase in cost for technology, but the curriculum materials will be expensive and the park test has been priced, priced at approximately $29 per student only for one formative and one end of year test. These developments would seem by necessity to remove much of our local district's ability to con control its curriculum. I ask that this board assemble a work group to write a resolution or a statement on this district's position on the Common Core, our control of curriculum, and the desire for an accountability measure that is based on a locally developed curriculum that meets the needs of our students. 
I also suggest that it would be beneficial to, to solicit written input from parents and teachers prior to its final publication. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barrios. Good evening. Good evening. I'll try to be as brief as I can. You know that's difficult for me. But uh, I want to just say, first of all, I want to thank the school your name board here. Elsie? Mm -hmm. My name is Elsie Burkhalter, and I'm presently the president of the St. Tammany Federation of Teachers and School Employees. And uh, I want to personally thank my school board members here because of the when we are in activities like this in Baton Rouge where it starts, you always do your part. And, and I want to let you know that we appreciate it, that you do your part for what we believe is right for public education. And I mean, you help us lobby our board members and everybody else up there, and I know that for a fact. And also, the staff here. Now, a lot of the parents that are here tonight do the same thing. And that's where it started. We could stay here and scream at you all night, tell you how we feel about you, and then scream some more. The changes are not going to make be made unless we change people. We have our best board member here, and I'll say it in front of him. Does he support what we believe in in St. Tammany Parish? That's the first thing we should look at when we send people to Baton Rouge to represent us. And I mean, that goes from our legislators, our senators, our governor, and our best board member. That's where it starts. I mean, I could make a big speech to you why I think all this is wrong. But you can't do anything about it. <laughs> you can postpone, but it's here like a law. And when we were fighting in Baton Rouge, it's where we needed the help. And, it, and we, we lost the battle, not that we didn't fight for it. And I didn't intend to pass out these letters that I wrote about it tonight. Because what our position has been since we lost the battle in Baton Rouge, was to postpone this, and that's the position that we have taken now, that the Common Core should be postponed, and, and that's what we can do with a law that has been passed. So that's what we are trying to do now. So I'm passing out these to you so you can see this is our position. And uh, I thank you for helping us when we we're trying to fight for the best cause for children. And I know what will happen with Miss Araby. She'll stay up all night long, all day long, five days a night if she could, in one night to try to make everything work for us. I know this school board and this staff here. I know these teachers and employees that work for this school board. Yes, sir. They're going to bend over backwards, all of us, as a family, to try to make this work. But I agree with everything that I've heard, the parents and the citizens that spoke here tonight. It's a shame. But you know what? They're going to keep kicking us in Baton Rouge till we make some changes. And that's the, that's the honest truth. We have to see where it starts. And it, you didn't make these laws. You didn't make this Common Core. It's people that probably <laughs> never taught a day in their life some of them didn't go to school, didn't go to college that was voting on that for those kids. And, and that's the problem we have. And uh, we just got to say no. I, that's how I feel. We just got to say no. That's Thank it. you. We got to say no. We can't get to this in time. We can't do this. The parents are with us. And everybody, tell Bobby and the Bessie board to go to where I would like to tell them. But I can't. I'm a professional and a citizen and a Christian, so I won't say it. <laughs> thank you very much but for your comment. I want to thank this board. You hang every time and do the right thing, and you work to try to make everything right for kids. That's why we the highest test scores again this year. And uh, it's nothing else I can say, but let's not do this. We need to put it off, and we can't do it successfully if we cared about children. Thank you. I see the probably the last two speakers that would for tonight. So.
so they just want to stay up there so, yeah, thank yes. you i'm ralph rosto again thank you and uh miss El um miss El elsie yes uh thank you for your comments but i have one little disagreement um the you said that it's the law we we can't do anything about it that that's wrong uh, right. it, you know, slavery used to be legal. You're right. You're exactly right. We are going to change this. We will not stop until we do change this. And I have one question for Mr. Garvey. Do you support Common Core? It doesn't matter if you answer it there or here. Yes or no, do you support Common Core? As of today, I do. Thank you. We will do something about it. I just have a question for Mr. Garvey. Your name, please. Debbie Sachs. Thank you. Mr. Garvey, does Bessie have the ability to remove us from PARC in the high stakes testing? I don't know the exact answer to that. I can uh, take a guess from what I know in general. I believe we do. There are I think 25 roughly states that are uh, ha have chosen the park test uh, to use, but there are another 15 or 20 roughly states that have chosen another test to use. It's not park. I, I don't remember the name of it because it's not the one that we're using. Uh, we probably could switch from park to the other one, and there's a. Someone mentioned that there's a possibility of just opting out of both tests. Yes, that, that, that's what I'm without, interested in. Without opting out of the Common Core. That right. is a, an idea that was presented to me earlier today. Yeah, that's good. I haven't had time to look into that possibility. I would love it if you would look into that possibility because it would really free up our school board and our teachers and they wouldn't be as handcuffed. So that would be awesome if you could look into that. I, I would be happy to. As you know, I've, I've been researching most of the questions that you brought to me, if not all of the questions. And uh, I'm going to bring all of the concerns that I've heard tonight back to Bessie and share them with other Bessie members. Thank you. Uh, if I could, uh, and I'll try not to take much time, I brought some handouts that I thought the school board members would find useful, and I wanted to pass them out. I'll give them to Ms. Araby, but let me give you a description of what they are. They're... Uh, four different sets of the exact common core standards for third grade math, third grade English, eighth grade English, and seventh grade math. If you want to see the exact standards, this is, this is them. And I'll give them to you in a minute if you don't mind because I want to take four or five to give to the crowd because I have roughly 20. And I think that would leave enough for the school board members. Um, I have an article that was in the advocate a lot of y'all probably saw it which describes how uh, i think it's plaquemines parish is uh going through the switch over to common core and I, I think it's good to get a perspective of how another parish is uh experiencing this and i have two other papers uh one that explains or attempts to explain anyway why the new math standards are an improvement over the old math standards. So i uh, pass this out to you. And uh, the final one is a paper explaining the new data uh, requirements or the data distribution requirements under Common Core compared to what it was before. And the basic message in here is that there is no new, uh, are, there are no new rules regarding the dissemination of data uh, to the feds, which uh, there's a fear that if it's passed on to the feds, it will then be passed on uh, to other entities. There are no new requirements for sharing data. Um, there are no plans that I know of at Bessie to have new types of data being shared compared to what we have been doing for years. No additional data, no, no new changes, and as you may have heard, there was an agreement that was entered into by uh, Superintendent White with InBloom where some data was stored on their site uh, for a month or two, I think it was, 
No one accessed that data other than department, Louisiana Department employees, um, my investigation tells me. Uh, and there was no plan to share that data with anyone. Um, not to say that there would not have been at a later date, but to date there was none. Um, and that agreement was ended and that data was removed from that site. So um, with that, I'll take some copies and pass the rest to Ms. Araby. Oh, I did want to add one other thing. Uh, an issue came up or a question came up about can St. Tammany or can a school district go beyond the state standards? I asked uh, Superintendent White this today, as a matter of fact, and a couple of weeks ago. I asked him again today because I wanted to make sure I heard him right the first time. And this came up in particular regarding algebra in eighth grade and the effects that it could have on whether students would be able to do pre-calculus and calculus before they get out of high school in order to be ready for some colleges that expect you to be on that level. And his response was absolutely the standards, the, a school system can go beyond the standards. For example, uh, as we had the GLEs that I mentioned earlier, the old state standards, uh, those GLEs, as I understand it, did not require algebra in eighth grade last year. But yet schools and school systems were able to give some students algebra in eighth grade going beyond the standards. The same is true under the Common Core Standards. The Common Core Standards do not require algebra in eighth grade. They do not line up to have algebra in eighth grade. But a school or a school system can decide to do that for some students or for all students, whatever students uh, that are there that want to get algebra in eighth grade. So uh, I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Do we have any other any questions for Mr. Garvey? I have no years of teaching. But the majority of the members on BASI have been teachers. Okay. Do your kids go to school that has common core? My kids go to my kids. Uh, only two of them are in grades old enough to, to fall into this category. And they have a blended common core, non-common core is my understanding. Uh, that was a question that I wanted to pose to the principal last week, and I didn't have time to do it. But the uh, homework that I was working on with my son last week had appeared to me to have Common Core elements in it. Um, and when maybe, okay, maybe can we wrap this uh, committee as a whole? And if you do have qu questions for Mr. Garvey, hopefully Mr. Garvey will stay after and answer those questions for yes, people. I appreciate that. Uh, no further business. I, oh, I apologize, point? Superintendent Foss. Uh, thank you all for being here. We have been meeting on Thursdays forever. <laughs> Yeah. We have the first, the first Thursday is two committee as a whole meetings, both committee as a whole meeting, and the second Thursday of the month is always our full board meeting. And public is what, and special meetings are always announced publicly and posted on the website. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Foles. Yeah, what I wanted to say was just thank you all for being here. You know, I appreciate your passion for this issue. Some of the things that we heard tonight are certainly common core driven. Uh, there's a couple things that I heard tonight that have nothing to do with Common Core that concern me that I can promise you that we will look into, especially one of the examples that you gave uh, just now. So I'd like to talk to you for a second before you leave. And the things that are under our control that concern me, we will certainly be on tonight. And the other things, we'll continue to work with you on the Common Core issues and do what we can to um, Make sure that we do in what we've always done in St. Townie Parish and what we're known for is to provide the best possible education for every child that walks through our doors. And I certainly recommit myself and our, and our staff to doing that. And we appreciate you all being here tonight for that. Thank you. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call the meeting to order for St. Anthony Parish School Board Committee as a whole meeting for September 5th, 2013 for business affairs and administrative purposes. Roll call, please. Mr. Derman? Here. Mr. Hannigan? Mrs. Heinz? Here. Mr. Luke? Here. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mrs. Tipton? Here. Mr. Jeter? Here. Mrs. Seeley? Here. Mrs. Mullet? Mr. Betancourt, Mr. Womack, Here. Mr. Payne, Here. Mr. Lamar, Mr. Alfred, Here. and Mrs. Belisario. Thank you. Um, we're going to dispense with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance, um, and there were no ones, no one requesting uh, time on our agenda tonight. Um, so we're going to move right into approval of minutes for a committee as a whole meeting. Held August 1st, 2013. Do I have a motion? Move. Moved by Ms. Tipton, second by Mr. Womack. Uh, any comments from board members? Any comments from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. So ordered. Um, next on up is Mr. Fulce. Thank you, Mr. Derman. First up for us tonight is the recommends acceptance of the final revised budget for fiscal year 12-13. This is actually the final, final, final budget of 12-13, um, closing the books on that. Very, very uh, happy with the final results and um, proud of everyone's effort. As, as we know, it's um, been a year that we certainly um, made some tough decisions. Uh, I think we made decisions that didn't impact instruction in the classroom but did decisions that helped us as we move forward to uh, give you a budget that um, certainly goes between the means and the monies that we had available to run the school system and I want to thank Cheryl and Terry and everyone this board and everyone that was involved in making those tough decisions and employees that um, certainly were part of those decisions as well and we would ask tonight for final approval of this um, budget as we move towards next year's budget. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Womack, second by Mr. Bedencourt. Uh, yes, Ms. Heinz. Ms. Araby, could you just remind us on uh, when we'll have um, updates as needed through the year, the dates again, the months? Absolutely. Well, this one's over. Yeah, this, this one's is, over. There will be no That's, more updates done. on this budget. So. Well, uh, the next item is the budget for next year. Oh, I'm that, sorry. That we're I've checked off the guy. Right <laughs> you can you can answer me. Just if you we're mean. not giving you any more <laughs> updates on this. One. We're done. <laughs> any other questions from board members? Ms. Siegel. This is just a comment. I understand that we are also going to be looking at it again, starting October first. Am I not? This yeah. budget right here is the budget that ends the 12-13 school year. The next item, item B, is the budget that we're working on this year, school budget. So what we're asking for right now is approval, the final approval of this budget that ended at the end of last school year. So this, this that year is over with. So this is we the gave final We gave updates throughout the year leading to this final budget. <laughs> okay. Any other? You understand? Okay. All right. You do you want to? Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none. Any comments from the public? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. All right, Mr. Fulce, now I guess we're going to talk about this year's upcoming budget. Yes, yeah, this year's budget. We'd like to give you some updates throughout <laughs> the year on this budget. <laughs> uh, what are the months, Ms. Araby, that we give the updates on this budget? Uh, we'll begin the revision uh, time in October, and then you'll get an update in November. And then the next one would be around the January time frame, April, and April, March to April with a report in April. And then you will have the final revision at the June time frame with the report at this time. So what you see here tonight is the initial budget. If you remember, we... Um, our last meeting we had a public hearing where we had 
public members um, come and speak. Also, I think Mr. Henning, because he was out of town, asked a couple questions as well. So you have the budget here tonight. It's a budget that we are, feel good, good about. It's a budget that's conservative in nature and one that will allow us some opportunities to grow as we continue to see how our student enrollment comes in, how our tax collections come in and things of that nature. That's the idea behind the quarterly updates. It allows us to be you know, very clear in what we're trying to do and allows us to just adjust ourselves appropriately and accordingly as we go through the year. We believe that this is a way that served us well this last year and certainly will serve us well again this year as we move forward. And just as I spoke on last year's budget, you know, we have a lot of people, Terry and Cheryl and all of us working, you know, every day to make sure that we're finding a budget that um, certainly gets the best bang for the buck. And I, I really feel proud of this budget um, and what it's accomplished. And I think I look forward to using this budget throughout the year to um, meet, meet the needs that we have for our school system. Thank so you. We, with that, we would a answer any questions about the budget. Mr. Bettencourt. Thank you. <clears throat> I suppose this would be to Terry. Just uh, a couple of things that I wanted you to clear up for me in the uh, page two the general fund budget there's an item uh, at 10 down so it's called TCE tax collection expenses but then um, five or six below that there's sales tax collection how are those two different if you can because it seemed like the same thing to me it's not. Uh, the TCE is property tax. The sheriff collects off the top. That's, that's an expense that we, we for that. The sales tax is for the sales tax. So it's an administrative fee that comes out of our gross. Okay. So they're two and different revenue sources. Well, this is an expenditure though, right? Correct, but we're paying right. an administrative fee basically. Okay, and then there's, uh, we have our teachers retirement school employees retirement and then there's an o or other retirement yes. pertaining to parochial retirement um, and we also have some people in uh, state retirement so that's the other retirement systems that we have some some people some employees participating in okay and one i guess one last thing can i bid on collecting those taxes because it's like two and a half million dollars uh, I'll no. do it for less than that. So I'll tell you, there's a lot of uh, expenses that goes into that as well. So it's I'm sure. Okay, I just wanted to clear those things up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bettencourt. Any other uh, questions from board members regarding the budget? Uh, Mr. Alford. It's, it's just a question of, do we have a final count for our head count for students? No, sir. We don't have a final count yet. We'll be take the when final. Is, when is it due? Well, there's one due October 1st, but then now October 1st. They, it's not, it used to be just once a year. Now it's again in Feb, February 1st, October 1st, February 1st. So as soon as we get those numbers in, we'll be sharing those with you. And that'll go towards our, you know, our first revision to have a true right. count of that as well. And I'll go ahead and say, let me just remind you this. Another thing that we talked about in the revision process was uh, the discussion of the one-time supplement that's coming from the state dealing with the uh, 2.75 and remember that it was um, designated by the state to be given to a certain grouping of certified employees and what we'll be bringing to you is a recommendation and we're not ready for it yet because we haven't seen the numbers but we'll be bringing a recommendation to you guys on what to do um, with other employees that would be in the, in the system that weren't in that grouping that the state designated as receiving that one-time supplement. Thank you. As Ms. Mullen. Right I'm sorry. We're, we have increased. We're not sure how much yet. I mean, we see some, some areas, but we've seen some growth, but it's still a little too early to tell exactly how it'll play itself out. Thank you. Ms. Mullen. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the superintendent's budget for 2014 2014. Thank you. Second, please. Uh, Ms. Uh, Belisario seconds that. Uh, any other questions by board members? Any questions from the public? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Pulse, for y'all's efforts on this as well. Um, going on into the administrative, Mr. Jabio, monthly maintenance and custodial report, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Derman. We have our three standing reports. Before I give those reports, I want to thank all of the uh, people in the central office and throughout this parish for their hard work in getting us off to a great start. Uh, with me in my new position, I can really truly see the teamwork that we all uh, work together for success. So I do appreciate each and every one of them. So Mr. Richmond and his staff is here for any questions on the monthly maintenance and custodial report. Any questions by board members? Seeing none, we're moving on. Thank you. In your packet is a monthly risk management report. Mr. Gaspard is here. Any questions? Seeing none. Next. And our transportation, Ms. Amy and Ms. Masters are here. If you have any questions, they've been working very hard and working out the routes and problems that we have and, and uh, doing a great job of that. So I thank them for that. All board members raise their hands on this one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ms. Belisario does have a question now. Sure. Not actually a question. I just wanted to thank Ms. Amy for the bus hotline. My constituents love it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Jamie, I think that concludes it. No other questions. Thank you, Mr. Darman. Miss um, Tipton, construction report, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. A uh, quick report. Um, just very happy to tell you that the Woodlake Gymnasium did open last week, and the school is using it. We got an email that showed they had an open house um, that he was in the gym and throughout the school and they had their Suzuki strings students on the new stage and uh, we got a very positive report back on that. So very happy to hear that. Uh, the contractor does continue to work in the wing five on that renovation at Woodlake. So the construction does continue there. The Brock classroom wing is getting closer to being finished. They're working their way out of the site. They're forming up to pour some sidewalks and do some grading and finish out around that building. So we're hopeful to see that finish this month. At Fifth Ward, the pre-K uh, building renovation is coming along really well. They've got the windows and doors in. They've got the air conditioning in. So that's moving along and progressing well. And then uh, with regard to the RFQs, we did receive those last week as well, the qualification statements. Um, we got about 97 responses. Wow. We're uh, going through an administrative processing of those and we're getting those out to the committee members this week. So the process of reviewing them will be starting here pretty immediately. Is that a, a high number of responses from before? This is, a, it was the most uh, that we've ever, not, the most packets we've ever sent out. We sent out about 132 packets uh, this bond issue, and that's probably double from last time. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Any questions by board members for Ms. Tipton? Uh, Ms. Sealing. Thank you, Ms. Um Just a quick question about um, when we go to start on Pearl River High School's work. I understand that what I'm hearing is that the students will have to be moved temporarily into some portables to um, allow for the wing work there. Uh, yes, is that the plan? In, in our initial uh, review of the project and preparing for the bond issue and looking at renovating through those original uh, wings, which do include classrooms, we do expect that there will be temporary classrooms to rotate through, you know, so that we can do perhaps a wing at a time, something like that. So we are going to plan that out. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. And what we found, and this is kind of what we tell everybody, it's kind of like when you do renovations or remodeling at your house, a little inconvenience. Mm -hmm. um, but we promise you, the finished product will be worth the uh, inconvenience, and um, that's what we'll ask mm -hmm. the teachers and the administration. And knowing Mike Winkler, he'll be one that'll make sure it works properly. And we'll ask them to um, put up a little inconvenience and the finished product is something I'm certainly that they will be um, proud of and happy with. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any, any other questions by board members? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move on to business affairs. Ms. Fortenberry. The purchasing report is in your packets and Ms. Stevens is here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions by board members? Seeing none, um, we're going to move on to 
Announcements by the President, Ms. Hines. Thank you, Mr. Derwin. The regular board meeting will be held on Thursday, September 12th at the C.J. Shane Administrative Complex at 7 p.m. That's it. Mr. Foles. Yes, um, board members, before we close, uh, we have a video that we wanted to share with you to close tonight. You know, last week, at the, towards the end of the week, I got, got a uh, phone call from the Covington Food Bank, and they made us aware that they were very low on supplies and um, foods um, that were needy, and certainly that they were starting to run very low. So I, knowing that we had a t principal's meeting on <laughs> Tuesday, we put out an email and a text message to our principals at the last minute at the end of last week and asked each of them to bring um, some food items with them to the principals meeting and as normal our principals came through and last minute very flexible and put together a great show of generosity and channel 13 captured some of that for us and I thought tonight as we end our first getting close to the end of our first month or so of school and to be very thankful for the great start that we had as, as Pete mentioned um, I think our hard work this summer our preparation our teamwork our ability to make sure that we did as best as possible to have a great start certainly paid off and then for the principals to come and come to that meeting and show their spirit and show their generosity um, it certainly was moving to all of us that were there to see it and I think Channel 13 did a really good job of um, capturing that and I'd like to close the meeting with that tonight if we could. Yes sir and, and I think from all of our board members sitting up here tonight we want to thank everybody for the start of this uh, new school year what a great job everybody has done from our maintenance department to our administrators, our teachers, our students, bus drivers, everybody, everybody involved uh, with our school system. It was a great, great start to a, a new year. So we appreciate everybody's efforts, everybody's. Thank y'all. And so now we're ready to see you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Administrators from all the schools in the parish responded quickly to a request from their superintendent. Last week we had gotten a call from the Covenant Food Bank that they were running short, so I just thought it was a good opportunity knowing our principals always want to do something for the community. And we put out a word late on uh, Friday, and as you can see, the, the participation has been wonderful. A huge humanitarian response by school system leaders. The Covington Food Bank has struggled, as I think many of our food banks across our parish and across the nation have done lately. So it's just another small way that our principals can give back into the community. This demonstrates a genuine concern of the administrators and the central office personnel of the school board in order to help the people that are in need right now. But we certainly think we do have that responsibility as leaders in our community, as a school system. You know, when you have 37, 38,000 students and as many employees as we do, we have a responsibility. And I think every time we've asked, our people have certainly stepped forward. And this effort did not go unnoticed. When individuals such as the administrators of the public school system take it upon themselves to donate this volume of food to us, it shows their commitment to the people in our community who are less fortunate and who require the support of others within our community. Before food bank workers can distribute food over there, they must accept and sort food over here. We serve on average about 115 households a day. That's 6,000 to 6,500 pounds of food that we are distributing to the people in our community. So any and all donations that come into our facility are basically handled, sorted, packed, and put up back in boxes and goes out uh, pretty much the same week. All that work is accomplished by over 500 volunteers, some of whom process today's donation from school system administrators, totaling 684 pounds and that translates into 518 meals for food bank participants. I, mean, I think it helps us all reflect when you go to the grocery store and you buy some of these items and you realize you're buying them for other people and what the need is in our community. It kind of gets home and it, it lets you realize that you, you indeed are blessed and you have to give back to others as well. Tiger Edwards, Channel 13. And that concludes our meeting and we are adjourned. Thank you all.